Jesus calls us to meet him, as we do wherever we are now with worship at Wesley Online. As we begin our time of worship, may we be aware of God's presence with us through his Holy Spirit. May we experience his healing love with us. And may we learn to love each other as Jesus Christ has loved us. Martin Birkers is our speaker today and his theme is going to be holding a good grudge or turning to forgiveness. Holy God, to you alone belong glory, honour and praise. We join with the hosts of heaven as we worship. You alone are worthy of adoration from every mouth and every tongue shall sing your praise. You create the earth by your power. You save the human race in your mercy and renew it through your grace. To you, loving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be all glory, honour and praise, now and for ever. Amen. Gracious God, whose love for the world is revealed in your Son, our Saviour, grant that he may live in our hearts by faith and be proclaimed in our lives by love through the same Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and praise now and for ever. Amen.
The New Testament reading is taken from Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. Love for enemies. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Judging others. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. May God bless this word. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 11 and 15. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. May God bless this word. Amen. I love it when Jesus speaks plainly in the Gospels. Normally Jesus is telling us a story and we need to think about the characters and 
uh, what's happening in the story and we need to interpret it to understand what Jesus is telling us about who uh, God is and what God expects of us. But sometimes Jesus says it exactly as he means it, with no interpretation required. And this is one of those times. Jesus says, do this and don't do that because that is not very clever. In these moments, Jesus is almost always blunt, very much to the point, and rather difficult for us to hear. Here Jesus is asking us, love those who despise you because the alternative is life destroying. Makes me wonder, are you ever tempted to hold a grudge? Uh, I feel like I'm one of those people who's distinctly unqualified and unable to hold a grudge. I wonder if here Jesus uh, has seen the disciples beginning to hold a grudge, beginning to hate those who keep challenging Jesus at every turn. It meets the broken Jesus' heart. Jesus came for everybody, not just for the disciples, but for those who disagreed with him as well. And so it must have broken his heart to see the disciples starting to hate those people. And I wonder if that's exactly why Jesus stands up and says what Jesus says. So I'm uniquely uh, unable and qualified to hold a grudge. It kind of has always felt like it's a little bit too much effort to hold a grudge against someone who's done something wrong to me. But when I look at my family, my family are all very passionate, determined, excitable people. If you've ever had a conversation with me, you'll know those are probably good descriptors of me. Uh, both sides of the family are also stubborn. Uh, as stubborn, not just as earth goat, but as stubborn as a whole herd of goats. They also have a strength of resolve where so many in the family have done far more than they would ever have dreamed they were able and definitely far more than most people would have told them they might be able to achieve. And so uh, that strength of resolve, plus a little bit of a quick temper, which I certainly inherited the, a little bit of a quick temper. But those together means a lot of my family has a strong ability to hold a grudge. And I've never quite understood why I haven't quite been able to do it. But that's probably not a bad thing. Grudges are very funny, a very funny experience. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the saying, uh, resentment is like uh, drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Bearing a grudge is also always like that. When we hold a grudge against somebody or some people, uh, we are always the one who sits and drink the poison as if it's oh so sweet. Meanwhile, the poison is slowly killing us inside. Maybe I'll take that image a little bit further. I wonder if you've ever found yourself sitting and working or sitting watching telly, staring out the window at some beautiful scenery on holiday, sitting out uh, in the open with a lovely hot drink, your, whatever your favorite is, tea or coffee, or decadent hot chocolate, and you're busy sitting and sipping it absent-mindedly. And you get to the point after a few minutes where you go for a sip and there's nothing there. It's just a cold, empty cup. That is what resentment is like. We are sitting, drinking the cup, sipping it without thinking about it until we left not with a cup full of poison we would give to the person we resent or the person we hold a grudge against, but rather holding a cup that is disappointingly cold and empty. I wonder if I could take the picture one step further. I think when we resent somebody and we sit and we sip that poison, when we come to the end of that cup, it's not the cup which is disappointingly cold and empty. It is our soul which is disappointingly cold and empty. So that brings me to our Old Testament passage, uh, speaking uh, about Joseph's story. Joseph has an awkward life story, 
the people who should love him the most uh, beat him up and sell him into slavery. And Joseph can look at that worst moment in his life. And now with his brothers standing in front of him, starving, looking for food, Joseph can see that the worst thing that's happened to him is something that God has turned into something good. But he is standing there with the cause of all of his pain and suffering right there in front of him. And so Joseph realizes he does not need to drink the poison anymore. His brothers are almost certainly afraid at this point. I wonder if they think for themselves, we deserve whatever suffering this man pours on our heads. And yet, Joseph embraces them and welcomes them like his brothers. Now, two important notes. First, it's important to note that sometimes people deserve to be excluded from our lives. The relationship is toxic and causes pain and will always be toxic and will always cause pain. Holding a grudge and resentment are not about relationships which need to end. And also it's important to note that forgiving does not equal forgetting. When we forgive a person, we may hate what they did, but we're choosing not to hate that person. And also, we're not forgetting what they've done. The trust may be broken to a point that we will never trust that person again. Both cases are different to resenting the person, to holding a grudge, because resenting a person is to sit and mix poison absent-mindedly and to absent-mindedly sit, sip it like a cup of tea. Joseph has every reason to hate his brothers. They tried to kill him and they sold him as a slave. He probably spent years resenting them. I'm sure his first years as a slave were not as great as the time when he ruled all of Egypt and ran Pharaoh's household. But I think he realizes that to condemn his brothers here is to do something far worse. If he bears a grudge, it means he would be condemning his innocent little brother. He would be condemning his mother and father who love him, his sisters, his nieces and nephews. And he wouldn't just be condemning them to suffer, he would be condemning them all to die. The consequences of Joseph bearing a grudge here is to literally steal the lives of the people he loves the most. The exact same thing he is angry at his other brothers for doing to him. So with that in mind, we turn to Jesus' words. Jesus says these sorts of things in our reading. Love your enemies. Do not retaliate when you're attacked. Give generously, even to somebody who would rob you. And do not condemn anyone. I wonder how is it that Jesus can ask us to do so much? What about our own pain and our own broken hearts? There is no way for our hearts to mend when our hearts are filled with evil intent. I think Jesus knows that. I think that's exactly why Jesus saves us. God is kind to humanity. Despite our ungrateful, wicked hearts, despite our evil intent, despite our doing what we want and ignoring others, not loving God and God's creation as God would hope, still God reaches out to us because as long as we harbor evil intent, our hearts will never mend and will always be broken. Jesus puts it like this in Luke. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So, forgiving is not equal to forgetting. But sometimes we hold our own healing and the healing of the person who's wronged us in our hands. We have the choice to crush the life out of both. 
or to offer our forgiveness. Even where we need to make it clear to the person we're offering our forgiveness to, there is no place for a relationship here anymore. And so it makes me wonder, in a few chapters time, Luke will share with us the Lord's Prayer. And I wonder if these words are repeated from be merciful just as your father is merciful. Jesus changes the word slightly in a few chapters time to forgive our sins as we also forgive everyone who has sinned against us. I finish with a beautiful poem and prayer of Padrigo Chuma. Where there is separation, there is pain. Where there is pain, there is story. And where there is story, there is understanding and misunderstanding, listening and not listening. May we, separated peoples, estranged strangers, unfriended families, divided communities, turn toward each other and turn towards our stories with understanding and listening, with argument and acceptance, with challenge, change and consolation. Because if God is to be found, God will be found in the space between. Amen. Almighty God, help us to hold high the standard of your teaching, even when it is hard to apply it to our modern way of life. May we strive not to lower your standards or to change what you teach, but to pray diligently for a realistic understanding of what you want for us in every aspect of our lives. Gracious God, we pray for your blessing on our church and for your presence to be seen clearly in what we do and say each day. We pray that your joy and love will flow freely in and through us and that we might never be seen by those around us as falling short of the teachings of Jesus Christ our Lord. Creator God, we pray for your world we ask you to take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us your spirit of love for all people, whatever their race or creed. Drive away despair from our politics. Revive our dreams of justice and truth and restore our passion for what is good and right. Establish your just and gentle rule throughout the world, especially where there is conflict when peace seems so far away and so many have lost everything. We know that you can provide hope for a peaceful future. Father God, we pray for our local community. We ask that each of us will make use of the individual talents you have provided to enable each church group to flourish as a witness to you so that we may serve our friends and neighbours who are in need. Loving God, we ask for your healing touch on all who are ill or suffering. We especially pray for anyone we know who is experiencing emotional pain or is broken in spirit because of personal or family problems. Almighty God, we ask you to draw close to all those mentioned in our hearts so that they may be aware of your healing presence. And we ask you to provide your peace and comfort for them at this time. Merciful God, give courage and faith to all those who have been bereaved, either recently or at this time of year. We pray that by sharing their concerns and grief with you, 
they may find the strength to face the future. Everlasting God, send us out into the world, renewed by our worship and strengthened by our fellowship, so that we may be a witness to the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, and bring healing and reconciliation to our wounded world. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. peace of the Lord Christ go with us wherever he may send us. May he guide us through the wilderness, 
protect us through the storm. May he bring us home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown us. Amen.